Guten Abend from Hamburg, Germany. Today we have a special guest, Elizabeth Landis. Hi, Elizabeth. Hello. Where are you right now in the world? I'm in the Hudson River Valley of New York State. Okay, which is awesome. North of New York City. I reached out to you a few months ago, and I think back then you were still finishing your thesis. Mm -hmm. And the moment I saw the title of your thesis, I knew I have to talk to Elizabeth. What was your thesis about? Well, so um, I am a microbial ecologist, which means that I study the relationships between microbes in environments. Um, and specifically, I'm studying the relationships between microbes in fermented foods. So there were two things that I focused on for my PhD dissertation, which was, um, one was kombucha, but the other was sourdough. So I did a lot of analysis of people's home sourdough fermentations to kind of look at the relationships between the microbes that are, that are present there and how they produce bread. And explain this picture, please. This is you doing your work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's me sort of drowning in a sea of sourdough starters. Um, we asked people to send us their starters. And as you know, people who make sourdough are super enthusiastic about their starters. So we ended up getting um, way more than we bargained for. We got nearly 600 sourdough starters sent to us in the mail. So that was me sitting in a pile of those envelopes at the end of the sampling process. And were they mostly from the US or also international starters that were sent to you? Yeah, so we we mostly collected from the United States um, and, and Canada, but, but also a lot of European starters and many from Australia. Um, yeah, so it was like dense sampling in the US, but it was intercontinental. And now to everybody who is new to sourdough baking, maybe we can just quickly talk about what exactly is a sourdough? Yeah, so I can talk about what a sourdough is from a sort of microbial perspective, which is yes, I think please. bringing to the table. So um, maybe you could let me share my screen and I can show you some some microscopic mm -hmm. images of sourdough. Yes, I'm adding you here now. Look at this technology. Amazing. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, sourdough bread is made using a sourdough starter, which is a fermentation of flour and water. So basically you just mix together flour and water and the microbes that are in the air, um, can you see my pointer? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the microbes that are in the air and the flour or on your tools, um, they start to multiply in the flour and water and they start to rise the dough. So there are mainly two different kinds of microbes that we think about when we think about sourdough and those are the yeast, which add a lot of the leavening, the rise to the dough. Um, and then there are also a lot of lactic acid bacteria um, and those give sourdough its, its sourness, its kind of characteristic thing. Um, there are also other microbes in sourdough that we discovered when we, when we started to look at this project um, in way more abundance than we thought. And I can talk about that a little bit later, but sourdough is basically a multi-species fermentation um, of flour and water. And it's okay. maintained down here, as you can see, it's maintained like what well, in what a microbiologist would call serial transfer. So you take a little bit of that fermentation and you continually add flour and water and microbes can get in at any point during this process. So they can get in in the flour, the water or the environment. And of course, they're also transferred during this process where you continually feed the sourdough. And it's interesting that you mentioned this, but is there a way that maybe the, the process doesn't go in a way that you would expect it to go, because let's say there would be other pathogens coming from the outside and they would uh, intervene with this process. Is that possible? Totally. I mean, so the way a home fermenter would know that there was something interfering with their process is if it's not working or if it's moldy. Um, and that can definitely happen. But sourdough is pretty robust. I mean, um, this community, first of all, drops the pH um, it makes the fermentation sour, which excludes a lot of other microbes. Um, but, you know, there could definitely be path human pathogens in, in um, raw sourdough, which is why we don't generally recommend that you eat the raw dough itself, because um, you just wouldn't know, uh, you know, during the fermentation. Okay. And so you mentioned the, the yeast. So maybe mm -hmm. one more time, the focus on the yeast part. What exactly is the yeast doing inside of the sourdough? So the yeast 
it's very, you know, even though these are relatively like simple in terms of there aren't a lot of numbers of species present in these fermentations, it's complex. So they're doing lots of different things. Um, but one of the things that they're doing is they are breaking down the sugars that are in um, the flour, which is primarily maltose. Um, they're producing ethanol, they're producing some carbon dioxide, um, but they're producing a lot of other compounds too. And there are different kinds of yeast in sourdough. So your yeast might be a very different species than the yeast in my sourdough. And they can produce a lot of different compounds that produce different flavors. Um, and yeah, they can contribute even like, we studied one yeast called Wickerhamomyces anomalous that is- What was that? Wick Wickerhammer? Wickerhamomyces anomalous. It's like my favorite yeast. It's beautiful. <laughs> It actually produces banana compounds, banana smelling compounds, and it produces something called yeast killer toxin, which kills off other yeast. So there's like lots of different um, dynamics going on between these bacteria and yeast beyond just what you think about when you think about sourdough, like dough rise. So they kill off other microorganisms, Is that was correct? So it yeah. could be that at some point you would just have one kind of yeast in the end in your sourdough that they would just make sure that other yeast are are gone or do they live in an environment where they can work together so there's different dynamics happening depending on the the microbes that you have in your sourdough and that's a lot of what we studied in this in this paper that we just published on sourdough fermentation okay and so ethanol uh, so co2 i mean that's gas right that that does the leavening and ethanol is that's what gets you drunk right well, that's the hooch that you find, you know, on top of your sourdough. I, I have heard of people actually distilling um, ethanol from sourdough fermentations before. Uh, but <laughs> it's, it's that it smells like when I, to me, when I smelled these hundreds and hundreds of sourdoughs, a lot of them smelled like whiskey. You know, they have that kind of like um, hoochy smell to me from the ethanol production. Okay. And so the other part that you mentioned was the lactic acid bacteria. Maybe we can just talk about that one more time as well. So mm -hmm. what is the bacteria doing in the sourdough? Well, they do what they do. They're named lactic acid bacteria because they make a lot of lactic acid and they're making other acids too, but primarily they're making um, this lactic acid that together with the yeast fermentation is making this sour. So um, they're producing that compound, but also many other um, sensory compounds that can change the the um, the sort of profile, the sensory profile of your dough. And then beyond the lactic acid bacteria and the yeast, we actually found this third group of microbes, which um, we don't think about very often when we think about sourdough, but they're called acetic acid bacteria, and they're making vinegar. So we found in our study that around 30% of um, I think that's right, maybe less than 30% of sourdoughs that we sequenced had these acetic acid bacteria present in them, um, which is way more than we had originally thought. But these are bacteria that most people think about in vinegar or kombucha fermentations. So we were surprised to find that there was actually a lot more of those than, than we might have expected. Interesting. So I thought that <clears throat> lactic acid bacteria can both produce lactic acid and acetic acid, but there's one group that just produces acetic acid. Yeah, so they, you're right. You're right that lactic acid bacteria can also produce acetic acid, but the acetic acid bacteria produce a lot more, um, which is why we okay. call them bacteria. And um, yeah, so acetic acid bacteria are what's the are the things that make the floating blobs in a kombucha um, and also in vinegar fermentation but we do find them in sourdough as well that's super interesting so i have a nice bread here so this is elizabeth one time you have to visit me in germany this is i uh -huh. would say the bread we germans love it's a rye bread if you check that out the crumb is relatively dense but um, the typical german rice starter also has a lot of um, acid inside. So it has a very, very, very strong flavor. And uh, if you just taste it, I think this is why your thesis is so interesting because this just makes so much amazing bread. Yeah. Oh man, I wish I could taste it. I, I don't even have any there right now. It's really a shame. 
I think we Germans are a little bit strange in that regard. We mostly eat rye bread here, here though, so not so much wheat bread. But I think when you try to bake at home, then it's always very important that you understand a little bit of what's going on. And that's why I wanted to chat with you because yeah, you know a lot more about what actually happens behind the scenes. <laughs> and the next question I had was also related to that is how are the yeast and the bacteria different? So they both they both work. And um, yeah, if you may, maybe could talk about that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, most microbial systems contain fungi, so yeast are fungi. Um, as well as bacteria and other microorganisms like archaea. Um, and sourdough is cool because we have, you know, this cool diversity of microbes, including yeast and bacteria that are working in conjunction. So a lot of times in a sourdough, the yeast might eat one kind of sugar and the bacteria will eat another. And so they kind of work in conjunction with each other so that um, one might even eat the waste products of the other. Um, so it's sort of, a, it's really an ecosystem that is working to break down the sugars. And it really depends on what yeast and bacteria you have to know what sugars are being broken down by who, um, which makes us just a really delicious thing to study because there's all these intricate, you know, differences between people's sourdoughs that we can look at. Um, and it's a really fascinating microbial ecosystem. I also once heard that the lactic acid bacteria are eating the ethanol that's produced. Have you heard about that before? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and uh, we know that also acetic acid bacteria can eat ethanol. So, um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of different dynamics. And once you have more than two, you know, it's more than just two things as well. So it becomes um, complex very quickly when you start adding things together. And how, how are you able to do all your studies without contamination? I guess that's a big problem, right? Well, um, we've got that part pretty well uh, figured out in the lab. Um, one of the challenges with this study was actually working with sterile flour. It's pretty difficult to sterilize flour without changing it a lot. So okay. um, because most of the processes that you would use to sterilize something uh, are like heat, um, which can just, you know, we'll, we'll change the chemical properties of the flower. We even looked at gamma irradiating our flower to do these studies, um, but we ended up just uh, autoclaving them, which means that we expose them to, to some heat and moisture. But, um, but yeah, that was a challenge to kind of think about how to work with flour that didn't have a lot of microbes in it to begin with. So because you had your sourdough samples and you didn't want to contaminate them with the flour that you used then to feed your your sourdough starters or? Right, so the picture you just showed, and maybe we can look at it one more time, is mm -hmm. um, this is a sample of sourdoughs that we recreated. So um, these are, these are used from people who mailed us in their sourdough we actually froze them at negative 80 degrees Celsius and then revived them later on to see how people's sourdoughs are different in terms of how they rise and the actual chemicals, the aromas that are coming off of the doughs. So, um, so in order to do that, we had to revive them on the same type of flour to kind of have an even playing field for all of the different microbial communities. And so that's where we had to sort of think about, well, how do we get, um, flour that doesn't already have microbes in it. So that was a little bit of a challenge to think about how to sterilize. Which flour did you use to reactivate them? Was that a white flour or a whole wheat flour? We used um, a 50-50 mix of white and whole wheat, thinking that that would be kind of neutral. We didn't use rye, though we did have a lot of um, people who sent us sourdoughs that they started on rye. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And when I look at this picture uh, one more time, I mean, it must have been so much work to do all this research. Did you notice any significant difference in terms of rising patterns between the sourdough starters? We did. So um, is that the video that you have there? Is that the, a photo? Uh, this was just a photo. 
Okay, I think I can actually show you the video of those rising from my screen. That's super interesting. And while you're searching for the video, yeah, uh, this is just a beauty that I made the other day, also with sourdough. And to everybody who's just who just joined, um, or to everybody who has not seen the video yet, this is the Neapolitan style pizza sourdough recipe that I published last week. So also check that out. You can use your sourdough to make so many delicious different foods. That looks so so yummy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just let me know when you're ready with the screen share. Let's see. Okay. Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Okay. I'm adding your screen to the stream again. Okay. Oh, you know what? I'll, I I think the video actually won't work on this one, but um, I can just show okay. you real quick. So this is what we ended up doing was reconstituting these sourdoughs. We did we reconstituted forty of the five hundred, and we looked at the dough rise patterns um, over 36 hours. And mm -hmm. we actually used stop motion photography to quantify how much they were rising over time. So we tracked, we, we did three replicates. So it was 120 different doughs and we tracked them over 36 hours. And we also measured the compounds coming off of the doughs. So we partnered with these chemists um, who are also sensory experts. So they, smelled the doughs um, and were able to assign them sensory profiles and they did chemistry on each one um, to be able to determine what compounds were coming off. And the really interesting thing that we found um, is that, so this is kind of a crazy data set, um, but yeah, Love let it. me just explain this real quick. So what we found was that so this is the dough rise rate. If we look, each one of these columns is a different sourdough starter that we sampled. Mm -hmm. And the um, the top row is the percentage of acetic acid bacteria, that third group of bacteria that I told you about, mm -hmm. um, the percentage that was in the sourdough starter. The second row is the dough rise rate. And the third row is the dominant sensory note. So purple means that the dominant sensory note was vinegar, acetic acid. And brown, for example, means yeasty was the dominant sensory note. And what we found was that this, the really big distinguishing factor between these sourdoughs, both for the rate of rise and the dominant note, was how much acetic acid bacteria were, was present. So actually, it turns out that this third group of bacteria that we don't think about very much when we think about sourdough has a really big impact, both on how fast your dough rises and um, what it smells like. And, and probably what it tastes like. We didn't actually do tastings, we did smell smellings of the dough. But um, but yeah, so doughs with this acetic acid bacteria in them tended to have slower dough rise rates and they tended to smell like like vinegar, which is maybe okay. not, yeah. Not something that you necessarily want in every sourdough. Although I guess it also depends on what kind of bread you're baking, right? Um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, I can tell you, you know, which microbes are likely to give you which notes, um, but it's up to you to decide sort of, right? Like if those are desirable or not, since there's so many different kinds of power then. What about the ratio between um, the yeast and the lactic and acetic acid bacteria? Is it a, what, what, what's, how, how much yeast do you have? How much lactic acid bacteria and how much acetic acid bacteria do you have? So there's been some excellent work on um, the dynamics of fermentation over time, uh, especially from European sourdough scientists. Um, and what they found is that there's, it's usually about a hundred to one bacteria to yeast um, in terms of numbers of cells, but that changes over the course of your fermentation. So uh, as you can imagine, when you first add the flour, it's gonna be a bit different than when you are um, when the system is sort of starved for nutrients at the end. So um, that can change over time. And I would also argue that we haven't really, um, so this was the, this is by far the largest study of sourdough in terms of numbers of sourdough starters. Um, but, you know, we haven't had wide sampling of all aspects of sourdough 
fermentation. So I, I would argue that there still needs to be some more work to figure out the diversity of microbial communities in home fermentations. Because even though we've been fermenting sourdough for thousands of years, um, you know, there's still a lot to learn about microbial communities, I think, in these fermentations. One thing that I find interesting is when you make beer, for instance, over time, whenever beer has been made, they would take a little bit of that previous beer and put that into the next uh, mixture. And so in Germany, beer has been brewed for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And over time, they sort of have developed a super, super yeast for fermenting beer. Is yeah. that something that in theory could also be possible with sourdough that you create a super sourdough, which is just really good at fermenting flour? Totally. So, um, so this is a really interesting question because it's actually the same species. You know, we we tend to find a lot of Saccharomyces cerevisiae even in which is brewer's yeast. Um, we tend to find a lot of that even in sourdough. Um, so we think like Saccharomyces cerevisiae brewer's yeast is like a domesticated yeast. It's used in wine, beer. Um, it's the thing you buy in packets when you buy packets for. Of, of yeast uh, or bricks of yeast, um, but it's also found in sourdough. And so there has been a lot of work done to look at how there are the different strains of Saccharomyces are adapted to these different environments. And it's true, there's like a sake yeast and there's a beer yeast and a wine yeast and a bread yeast. Um, and I think the next really interesting thing to look at is sourdough yeast because they're sort of, they're semi wild and semi domesticated. So I think that's, um, uh, that would be an interesting next step to look at these, the genomes of these yeast. It's super interesting. I was recently chatting with Carl the Smet, also known as the sourdough librarian. And he mm -hmm. says that in maybe 15 years or so, there's going to be the perfect sourdough bread because for the last hundred years, people have really just been focused so much on working with yeast, not so much on sourdough. Um, I feel that also the research that you are doing right now, it just helps to understand everything even better because in terms of bread, these days people are going back to the bread that has been baked a thousand years ago. They're not so much focused on the bread that was developed a hundred years ago. It's sort of like we missed a hundred years of bread baking science mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, and the, there's also, you know, different kinds of sourdough happening all around the world right now, too. Um, this study was primarily focused on, like, you know, one kind of sourdough fermentation, but there's so many kinds of bread making that start with a fermentation of flour and water. Um, and and I think there's there could be interesting diversity there, too, in terms of the microbes. So you said there's a ratio of 1 to 100, roughly. Um, when we talk in absolute numbers, how many uh, lactic acid bacteria or yeast organisms are in such a small sample? Well, I'm going to have to bring up a data slide again to show you, I think. Um, please, please do. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite um, images from the paper that we just published. Let's see. This is what we call the rainbow of sourdough. Um, and this is actually a bar chart, but it just looks very strange because there's so many different bars. So there's 500 different bars here. Each individual column is, an, is a sourdough starter. And up here, we have the bacteria that we're showing, the lactic acid bacteria and the acetic acid bacteria. And down here, we're showing the yeast. So first of all, if we just focus on the yeast, you see, there's a lot of this one color, uh -huh. and that's the that's the that kind of gold color is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, baker's yeast. So most sourdoughs contained Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Most contained baker's yeast. The second most abundant thing was this um, Kazakhstania humulus, which is here in the teal, um, and then the bacteria tended to be a little bit more diverse. So as you can see, each one of these different colors here is a different species of bacteria. And the yellow colors are those acetic acid bacteria that I told you turned out to be really important. Okay. And um, so now go, going back to the yeast, you said mm -hmm. there's a 
one to a hundred ratio, then this is not really reflected here, right? Or how do I understand it? In the bottom, it's yes. zero to a hundred percent. Yes, great question. So this is relative abundance. So um, the way we do, the way we identify these is through sequencing. And just one sort of like artifact of that is that um, we get an, we get, we have to measure them separately and we can't directly compare the yeast and bacteria. So this is saying what percentage of the bacteria are each species and what percentage of the yeast are each, I'm sorry, are you in, what percent of the bacteria um, are each species within a given sample and what percentage um, are a yeast species within a given sample? So you, you had to sequence every individual sourdough starter. How much time does it take to sequence one of them? So they are all sequenced together on an array. Um, the really time consuming parts of this study were first of all, analyzing the data because, um, and I have to give a lot of the credit there to Angela Oliverio, who is the co-first author on the study. Um, but we asked people so many different questions about how they make sourdough. So we asked them like, all the way down to whether they had a cat or a dog or a lizard. So looking at- <laughs> A lizard. Them, yeah. Did some people have a lizard? They did, yeah. <laughs> and like what kind of flour they were feeding and how often they were feeding. So we were looking at how all these factors shape your sourdough. And so analyzing all of those factors together was time consuming. And then also just like, we did a lot of studies where we paired microbes together to look at how they compete with each other or how they get along. Um, and so that those are also big studies. Um, and um, and then collecting all the sourdoughs too, you know, just dealing with the the huge influx of sourdoughs. This is about a, a five year project. Wow, five years. <laughs> and so now just going back to the question one more time in absolute in absolute numbers, is it possible mm -hmm. to say are we talking about uh, a million, a billion, how many microorganisms are in a sourdough? Mm. I mean, you'd have to quantify, I might have to get back to you on that, um, but you'd have to quantify per, you know, per un unit of measure. Um, I can say that in terms of numbers of species, there are less, there tend to be, as you can see from this image, there tend to be less numbers of species of yeast than numbers of species of bacteria. So I think it was 1.7 on average yeast per bacteria. So you might have a couple of different species of yeast, but you tended to have many more different species of bacteria per sample. So you both have more numbers of bacterial cells and more kinds of bacterial cells than you have kinds of yeast and numbers of yeast. Interesting. And how much, or is it even possible to say, how, how much on average does it take for such an organism to replicate for yeast and for the bacteria? Um, so it really just depends, I think, on the bacteria and the yeast, you know, really fast bacteria can have what we call a doubling time, meaning that they double the population every 20 minutes. Um, every 20 minutes. Yeah. Like a, a, a fast bacteria, um, yeast tend to have somewhat slower doubling times. I can, um, share with you a time lapse I did of yeast growing, um, Baker's yeast growing. Um, but it just really, again, like, uh, really depends on the, the species. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now for the bakers, it would be interesting to know a little bit, probably what are the best conditions for the different microorganisms, which conditions do the bacteria enjoy and which conditions does the yeast enjoy? Mm. So here I have to hedge what I'm saying a little bit in saying that I'm not that there's so many kinds of expertise involved in sourdough production. And uh, I really respect the expertise of bread makers. And I think that the intuition people have and the, really the, the science that people are doing at home um, around dough fermentation is, is a whole separate field of expertise than knowing what the microbes are doing with each other. And so both kinds are needed. Um, and since I'm not an expert bread maker, I can't say for sure like which conditions are the best for sourdough production. Um, 
and even for the different uh, yeast and bacteria, I would want to do more studies to like know for sure for each bacteria and each yeast. It it is uh, highly dependent. So. Yeah, I think that would be super interesting to know uh, which conditions are best for the yeast. And then, of course, maybe you have to look at your own sourdough starter because it's unique again compared to others. Exactly. So I think the, the sort of like um, iteration that people are doing at home for their particular sourdough starter is really important because it really matters. Well, one of the things we found is that the mic microbes that are in your sourdough really matter in terms of dough rise um, and the aromas coming off. So when we compared sourdough starters from all of our participants in terms of like how they function, they were really different based on which microbes were present. So your, yeah, your sort of specific recipe um, might work well for you, but not for someone else. Interesting. I think for the sourdough bakers, it's also very interesting to play with the flavor. And you told me before that you measured the flavor um, components somehow. Mm -hmm. And you also explained now that you measured them with your nose somehow. How, how did that How did that work? So we were really lucky to work with this um, Tufts Sensory Science Center. And they do a number of things. They do um, their experts, expert sniffers so they can smell um, and identify really specific compounds in all kinds of uh, products but so they, they use their nose to smell it they do that so that's one component another component is we use um, gas chromatography so we actually do chemistry on the compounds coming off of the dough we put in this little uh, sort of stir bar that's coated in a special coating that actually absorbs all of the volatile organic compounds, all of the smells that are coming off of the dough. And then we later bake them off and use analytical chemistry to measure the individual components of this, of each sourdough. And then we do actually do a third thing, which is that the sensory scientists, um, they have this thing on the, um, on the, gas chromatography uh, machine that they, it's called an olfactory detection port. And it's literally just like a little, a little nose cone that you put your nose into and you smell the, the compounds as they're being separated. So it links the sensor data to the um, analytical chemistry. So we have this really great array of different kinds of data where we can analyze these um, individual compounds coming off of the dough. Now imagine you had a dog that was testing yeah. your sourdoughs just for the different scent. <laughs> the human nose is actually super uh, sensitive and can smell compounds that even our, our gas chromatography cannot detect. Is that the reason why you chose this, uh, this sensory test with a nose rather than a taste test? Well, we were trying to also get around baking hundreds and hundreds uh, of different. Um, I see, different. yes. <laughs> and the other thing is, is that um, even though these are just sourdoughs, because we work in a microbiology lab, we treat them as though they are, um, you know, biologically hazardous because that's the protocol that we, we treat everything with. So we never taste anything in the lab, um, even if it were to be cooked. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Another question that I wanted to ask you, and I think you explained it a little bit before, was how do you measure things like bacterial growth or yeast growth? How do you know how do you know how many organisms are inside of your sourdough? Hmm. There are many ways to do that. Um, one of I think the most accurate ways is really just to it's kind of old-fashioned, but is to just put it on a petri dish and count the number of colonies that form. So that's really a very accurate way of doing it because you count only the ones that are living, and which is generally the ones you care about because you also have a lot of dead cells in there too. The other way to do it is to sequence them. So use DNA sequencing. But in that case, it's you can't really distinguish between the living cells and the dead cells. And would you then extra, extrapolate from the petri dish uh, to the overall population because you take the weight and then you know how much organisms are inside? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
And from a size perspective, are are they the same size, the yeast organisms to, to the bacterial, or are they is one completely a lot bigger than the other? Yeah, the the yeast tend to be bigger, so they're like four to five times bigger uh, than the bacteria, and okay. and they look different. I could yeah, I could go back to the slide showing the microscopy. Yes. But yeah, yeah. That would that would be interesting. Yes, please. Sure. Um. Okay. So everybody, if you just joined, I'm chatting with Elizabeth Landis, a microbiologist um, that has dedicated a lot of her time in the past years to studying different sourdough stutters. And one more time, a picture of Elizabeth. She has analyzed more than 500 different sourdough stutters, trying to figure out what are unique patterns that you see in them. And she has offered to be here on the show to answer all the crazy questions. So if you have a question, I'm also reading the chat, by the way. I'm just trying to make sure that we are not um, fiddling around too much with the interview flow. But I'm reading your questions here. So if you have something cool to say, please just drop a message in the chat. By the way, there are also dial-in credentials written inside of the description. So if you want to ask a question in person and join us, then you can do that. You just have to uh, click the link there, and then you can say hello to us. OK, sorry, Elizabeth. Oh, that's great. You, you wanted to show a picture, I think. Yeah, so you were asking about the, the differences between the yeast and the bacteria. So this is a microscopic image. Um, and now I can tell you about the third thing that's in this this picture, because I talked about I think it a little you still bit. Need to, still need to press the share screen button. Oh, sorry. No worries. Ah, yes. How's that? Here we go. OK, so, so in this image here of a sourdough starter, you can see the yeast, which are um, larger. And you can also see, actually, they have little what we call, I think these are bud scars that you're looking at. Um, they could be vacuoles too, but bud scars from where they've divided in the past. So they actually bud off their budding yeast to create daughter cells. And then you can often see where they've done that. So there might be some, some little um, sort of topographical features of these different yeast cells. So the big cells are the yeast, and then the ones that are grouped together here are lactic acid bacteria. And then over here, we actually have acetic acid bacteria too, which is a third thing that we often find in sourdough. And I was saying that those acetic acid bacteria can really alter the dough rise rates and the way that a dough smells and tastes. Super interesting. And at what temperature What's a toxic temperature for them? At what point when you're baking a bread are they going to die? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, and I can't say for sure. Like, uh, uh, they're, they're certainly all dead by the time you bake them. Um, but I don't know exactly what the, the threshold temperature is. I know that lactic acid bacteria tend to be particularly sensitive. And I know that from growing them in. Um, in the lab, uh, they're actually really fussy to grow, <laughs> lactic acid bacteria. Um, and the yeast tend to be a little bit more like robust and, and easy to grow. So perhaps that translates to... Uh, There's... Yeah. Sorry, didn't yeah. want to interrupt you. That's good. Uh, I, I just saw this question here from Anna. Um, I just wanted to talk not about the water ideal pH, but in general, have you used the pH as well in your studies? Have you been looking at the pH? pH was not something we really measured, but one of the things that I do want to talk about that we we did do a fair bit of analysis on was things that people think shape sourdough microbes. So we really looked at the hypotheses that are already out there in terms of like what bakers might think are shaping their sourdough micro microbes. So one of the big things is water. So people, people talk about water um, having an impact on the microbes themselves. So just to kind of sort of answer Anna's question, since we didn't really look at pH as a factor. Um, 
So we did not find that water source, like well water versus distilled water versus um, tap water, that any kind of like differences between water had an, we didn't find that that did, had an effect on the microbes. We also did not find that geography had an effect on microbes. So that's a big hypothesis that people have is that, um, that where you are in the country or the world might, um, especially here in the US, we have like a lot of myth mythology and like, um, and sort of hypotheses around San Francisco having a special sourdough microbiome. We weren't able to detect any like signature of geography in the US. We did find a weak, um, a weak impact of geography globally. So uh, there does seem to be some differences, but it didn't account for a lot of the differences between microbes. Okay. And there was a great question now from Orban Siegborg, and his question was, um, are you as a home baker able to create a starter with specific yeast and bacteria, or do we just have to accept that we have a bunch of random microbes inside? So one of the interesting things that we found was that if you buy your sourdough from a commercial source, like uh, an online seller, for example, you tend to have more of what we call lactic, uh, what we call uh, Lactobacillus san franciscensis, which is a some considered like a kind of desirable sourdough microbe. Um, and so, if you really want to control the microbes that are present in your fermentation. Um, you know, I would start with the sourdough starter that you know works well because we do find some evidence that, and this wasn't an explicit aim of the study, but we did find some evidence that sourdoughs are stable over time. So if you get a sourdough starter from someone and it's a sourdough starter you like, maintaining it in your home is, is possible. You know, uh, it could change over time, but it seems like there is some stability in these sourdough starters. So you'll, you'll be less likely to have a, sort of random sourdough if you get it from somebody as opposed to like mixing one up from flour and water and in, in spontaneously in your house. I think that's super interesting and also it makes sense because you probably have millions of those microorganisms and they already have an advantage when you add new flour and water to the mix so they can probably take over and push the other microorganisms out. Super interesting. Right. Right. Um, there was another question from OJ5K, and the question was, um, you tested just with flour, everything, but are there other compounds that you could use to influence, let's say, the growth of bacteria or yeast? Or do they always just need the flour, or could you also feed them other nutrients? I think that's that's the question. So we did have, um, one of the things that we found in our study was that many people do add other things, so um, grapes, uh, or they'll, they'll, especially when they're first starting their sourdough, they reported adding mostly fruit to the fermentation to get it going. Um, we didn't find that that selected for any specific kind of microbe. Um, but as I said before, we didn't work with absolute numbers of microbes, we worked with relative numbers of microbes. So um, I think that would be an interesting avenue and I, I i'm not i'm not totally sure we didn't study that um thank you then the next question was here from goran um mm -hmm. the question was are there regional patterns in america or europe and i think you already briefly answered that sure i can talk about it a little bit more um so let me just show you a map of where we sampled first of all mm -hmm. I think you just need to press the screen share button yeah. one more time. I have to select which one every time. Okay. No worries. Okay. So again, here's that. Here's the same picture um, of all of the Florida envelopes, but um, these were the points that we sampled. So we have the densest sampling in North America, um, but we did have a lot of sampling in Europe. Um, and as I said before. Here's some pictures. Um, we were interested to know how microbial species uh, are distributed across sourdoughs. And one of the big 
theories out there is that geography shapes sourdough. So we focused our analysis mostly to North America, but we also, just because we had more samples there, um, but we also did look globally. And one of the reasons we were so interested in this is because it's there's already ideas about this, right? So this is an old newspaper clipping from, um, I believe it's the New York Times or the San Francisco Chronicle, but it's, um, this headline is a tiny bug gives San Francisco sourdough its special taste. And this is just cool as a microbiologist because people don't really think about how microbes are different across spaces. You know, so it's cool that people have ideas about how microbes are distributed in the world. Um, and so we wanted to really look at this question from a microbial point of view, from a, a microbiologist perspective. And we didn't, find a strong signature of geography, especially looking at North America, there was no signature of geography. So geography didn't predict which microbes were in your sourdough. Um, and then globally, we did find that there were some differences, but most of the differences we found were actually among the molds that are in your sourdough, which kind of makes sense oh. as, um, because we find that molds tend to be different in different places. Um, and those are probably not active in your starter. They're probably just floating in, um, you know, on the dust. But that was the so, strongest we found. So the mold component in in the flower. So the flower is contaminated with mold. Um, it doesn't necessarily like when you do sequencing, you're just detecting the DNA. It doesn't mean that it's growing. It just means that it, it's there. It could have been molds uh, that were, or or they could have been fungi that were present on the plant when you ground up the flower. Uh -huh. So those are the differences we detected, um, and they're probably not super relevant to your actual sourdough uh, starter and how it. Did, just a small follow up question to that because I find that super interesting. Did you also measure this um, before? feeding the sourdough starter and then afterwards so is this population of mold or the leftovers are they actually decreasing after you fed the sourdough starter is that something you can answer um we didn't we chose not to focus on the molds too much again because we have this assumption that they are not very active so we really focused our analysis on the yeasts and the bacteria but that would be a really interesting follow-up. And it's something we considered to uh, consider doing because we it would be interesting to confirm whether or not molds have any part to play. But we we don't think so based on other people's work and um and just sort of like the biology of the microbes that are present. Yeah, I think it's super interesting because that would mean then that the sourdough also somehow cleans the flower that you have at hand. Right. Um, yeah, that would be interesting to, we could, you could measure the DNA or you could measure the cells, uh, the live cells by like throwing them on a dish. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, yeah. there, there was another question from uh, Jose and I think you already briefly answered that. Will the lactic acid bacteria um, change if you feed with a different flower. I think you said it will stabilize somehow, right? Um, yeah, so there is some evidence for stability in sourdoughs. There, uh, there is absolutely opportunities for change also because it's a pretty open system. I mean, you've got your like tools in there, you've got air coming in and your, um, your flour. So flour is actually very microbially rich. And a lot of the microbes that we find in sourdough starters, we also find in flour. So it's very possible that you are changing your microbial composition when you're feeding your sourdough. Interestingly, we actually find a lot of molds um, in rye flour. So just from the initial plate, I, I plated out a bunch of different flowers when I started this study. And rye was, um, this isn't quantified, we didn't publish this, but it seemed to me that rye was was really rich in uh, a lot of, like had a lot more different species present. Uh, that would be an interesting follow up though.
And I think it also makes sense because if you look at the weather in Germany today and the past few months, it's just been raining. So we have a very, very rainy climate. And I think the high humidity also helps, of course, that mold can grow a lot better in comparison to if you're in Italy where you have the perfect sun all the time, then that's not the climate that mold likes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I should be clear that like, you know, molds are present everywhere. Um, they're not, it's not a scary or like dangerous scenario that we have all of these different kinds of microbes growing on or, or present in the flower. It's totally to be expected. Um, you know, flour is a very like rich substrate and many of our foods, if we were to put them on a petri dish, we would find lots of different microbes growing in them. And that's just because the world is full of microbes. Um, so I, I, I know a lot of people have like kind of um, apprehension specifically around molds uh, because we think of them as, you know, invasive elements in our homes, but molds are, you know, a big part of a lot of food fermentations. There's a great question here from Thomas Milo. Do yeast die when they run out of nutrients or they become, I don't even know how to pronounce the last word and I don't, don't know what it means. Yeah, like kind of, I think like, <laughs> so do they, um, so yeast, so both, I think, I think both. So there, uh, yeast can become very, uh, I'll use your word, quiescent. And, um, <laughs> also they, they do die off. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think the answer is both. Yeah. But, so they die off after a certain period of time. Well, I mean, I've had the experience of, I'm, I'm a pretty bad sourdough fermenter myself. So I, I'm a very neg, uh, negligent at times, right? So I'll leave my sourdough at the, in the fridge for a really, really, really long time and then revive it and it seems to do very well. People also you know, dehydrate their sourdough starters and are able to revive them. So these microbes are tough. Um, so certainly lots of them will die off if there's not nutrients present, but Apparently, you know, enough of them will come back, even if you dehydrate them, uh, that you can get a reliable sourdough starter. Okay. One question, I don't know if you had a look at this as well, but interesting from a baker's perspective is the impact of salt on the fermentation. Mm -hmm. Does salt have an impact on the fermentation? I think common knowledge is um, that the more salt you have, the slower the fermentation is. Yeah. Certainly at some point, the, you know, if you add in enough salt, it would, what we, it would cause what we call osmotic stress. Like it would um, create an imbalance between the inside and the outside of the microbes that would be stressful for the microbes. I don't know at what point that happens, um, but any kind of like, you know, sugar will do the same thing. If you add a lot of sugar to a system, it will cause osmotic stress. So at a certain point, all microbes are susceptible to to these the presence of salts and sugars, um, but I can't say for sure. Yeah, like what what concentration? And a great follow up question related to that by C. Fazio, and I think the question is chlorine water because in the U.S. the tap water typically has chlorine, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So we looked at this in our study where we ask people like what kind of water they use. Um, and I can say in a broad way that it doesn't seem to have an impact on the microbes that are present. It doesn't like favor one kind of microbe or another to use chlorinated water versus not chlorinated water. But again, that doesn't mean that in your individual sourdough community, it's not making a difference. So broadly speaking, no, it doesn't seem to make a difference. Um, but but yeah, it could be making a difference for your microbes. That's super interesting. Um, so uh, another question by OJ, 5K when brewing beer, the optimal, you want to have a look at the temperature. Uh, did you do the same thing? Did you measure the temperature carefully when you were feeding your different sourdough starters? Which temperature did you go for? For our uh, experiment where we revived the sourdough starters and compared them, 
we wanted to use just one temperature because we wanted to measure how the just one very we wanted to change just one variable at, at a time so the variable yeah. we changed was the microbial community and we just kept them at room temperature so like i think it was 22 degrees celsius um so it's room room temperature um but people who sent us their sourdough starters ferment them at all different temperatures right and that was one of the factors we looked at um and it also didn't seem to impact the microbial community in a detectable way, um, whether you kept it on the counter versus in the refrigerator. Um, so yeah, that was that was not one of the factors that was influential. The factors that were influential though were, as I said, whether you purchased it from a business or whether you started it yourself, that tended to change the microbes that were in it. Um, whether you used rye flour seemed to make a difference whether you used whole wheat flour versus some other kind of flour also seemed to make a difference. And then the younger or older your starter is. So older starters tend to have more lactobacillus san franciscensis and younger starters tend to have a different lactic acid bacteria. And um, you mean older starters in terms of they might be a year old or are we looking at a feeding since the last feeding? The How old they are um, since they were started. So we had okay. some starters that were purportedly like over a hundred years old um, and many starters that were under one year old. And um, that seemed to influence which microbes were present in the starter. Very interesting. I mean, it also makes sense. The microorganisms in there over time, they will get used to the environment that I, that they are in, in which they are, right? So they will at some point push out other bacteria, I guess. Yeah, or perhaps um, perhaps there's some evolution happening over time. Uh, these are all really, this is why it's such an interesting and wonderful system to study as a microbial ecologist, because you can study evolution, you can study how microbes interact with each other and how they change over time and space. And that's just all really interesting elements. And I mean, you said sometimes they even reproduce after just 20 minutes. So there has to be a lot of evolution happening inside of the sourdough stutter every time. Right, so um, that's another benefit of working with microbes. I can, we can look at evolution, you know, within a couple of weeks um, rather than having to wait lifetimes uh, to, to really detect it. Yeah, I was thinking about changing my sourdough stutter um, to the exact amount of water that I also use for my main dough then, because normally the sourdough starter is, let's say, a one-to-one -one flour and water. Then I also wanted to already include salt in the whole mix. And just to make sure that my sourdough starter is already used to the main fermentation inside of my dough. My idea is to create a super starter, pretty much. Awesome. I love that. <laughs> and then and I'm I love mail you. Yeah, no, we actually have, we got sourdough starters mailed to us years after we completed the study. <laughs> Part of the study. And then the ICF FedEx container, I'm like, whoa, it's another sourdough. <laughs> if, you, if you could provide other scientists a few more areas of research, uh, mm -hmm. what would you say, where would you focus your research efforts on in the topic of sourdoughs? If you can give an outlook, what what's still out there where you think more research is needed? So um, there are some people who are doing some studies right now that I think are really cool. Um, Erin McKenney at, um, in North Carolina is doing some cool work because she was a co-author on this paper. Um, I think one one study that'll be really interesting is to do the kind of the reverse of this study which is in this study, we asked people to send us their sourdough starters. We collected them in one place and measured the differences between sourdough starters. What would be really cool is to start in one place and send out a sourdough starter to many different people and see how it changes. And that would be such a nice compliment to this because you know, we could actually, in a different way, test some of the same hypotheses that we tested here, um, really, directly like we know knowing that it starts out the same would mean that we can measure how different fermentation practices 
would affect um, a sourdough starter. And then I think also some of the questions that you and some of the um, some of the people have been asking today would be would be interesting to look at further. Things that are really interesting to bread makers, right? Like some of these parameters, like salt and um, and care practices, like how you care for your sourdough, how that influences both the microbes and the sensory profile. I think those would be really interesting follow-up questions. Um, but there's a lot of, I think it's a great system. So I think you could look at how microbes evolve um, over time. Uh, you could change different parameters, like how often you turn over the community, like how often you feed it um, or the temperature and see how that affects evolution. I think there's a lot of different avenues. So I could go on and on, but yeah, <laughs> I think it's really, well, there's a lot of remaining interesting research to do. So you now finished your PhD. What's in next for you? What are you going to focus on? So I'm actually switching to a very seemingly different system, but in some ways it's very similar, um, which is wastewater treatment. Um, so I'm gonna be looking at microbial communities in, um, in yeah, wastewater, which is kind of like a sourdough starter in some ways, because <laughs> I don't know if you know about like activated sludge, but it's basically, um, a sourdough starter that you feed to the wastewater to get it to break down. You actually have like a little starter of microbes that you add to the wastewater and that helps that helps break it down. So it's much like feeding a sourdough starter um, for a very different purpose. <laughs> but you can't eat it afterwards, I assume. No, but you know, eventually it does become drinking water again. <laughs> uh, fascinating, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Elizabeth. This has been uh, such an amazing interview. We've been chatting for almost one hour and it just feels like 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I guess, I'm, I, I guess really you could go on and on, yes. Yes, totally. And I love the interaction with the um, the viewers and, and uh, getting to hear those questions also, so. So yeah, keep me posted on your progress and maybe in a year from now or so, we can talk about microbes and wastewater. That would also be super interesting. Thank you so much for everything that you've been doing to this sourdough community, it's super helpful. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Uh, thank you all the viewers, thank you so much and uh, see you soon. <laughs>